Welcome to Crypto Disrupted, a cryptocurrency and blockchain podcast with your hosts, Trent Lipinski and Greg Kerr. Well, welcome. Welcome to, to Crypto Disrupted. This is our first show and our kind of introductory show to talk about uh, who we are and what our intentions are. And my name is Greg Kerr and this is Trent Lipinski. Um, so what we wanted to do is kind of lay out the format of what we're trying to accomplish uh, with Crypto Disrupted and talk about what principles that we're uh, practicing and creating this podcast. So uh, Trent, if you want to go ahead and give uh, a quick introduction and, and background of, about yourself. Who's yes. Trent Lipinski? So I'm Trent Lipinski. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I've been in the tech industry, gosh, since I was in high school. Um, I mean, arguably, I've been using a computer since I was four years old. So I guess you could argue I started there. Um, but uh, in high school, I ran a tech news and rumor site back before there were even really blogs. Um, the term blog didn't even really exist when I started my first site. Uh, so ran that, had tons of writers working for me, broke into a Steve Jobs keynote. Uh, you know, it was a interesting five-year adventure, ran ads, was monetizing it, eventually sold it, uh, went on to write for a couple other publications, uh, got in a bit of trouble doing that. Including <laughs> Playboy, right? Is this... Uh... Well, okay. So I wrote for, <laughs> I wrote for suicide girls actually. So playboy can, I didn't actually write for playboy. I eventually did work for playboy, but I was doing internet marketing and web development. Oh, okay. All right. So when I was writing and getting in trouble, I was writing for suicide girls. And I also wrote for uh Valley wag, which was owned by Gawker. Uh, so definitely got in a bit of trouble there. Um, so and suicide girls is what is a, um, is a feminist publication? Uh, you could call it you, that. I mean, it's it's Playboy, but girls with tattoos and piercings and uh, okay. that kind of thing. Right. So, uh, you know, they they had a, they used to have a blog, and I used to have a tech column there. Uh, and then, you know, like I said, I also did some stuff for Gawker and Ballywag. So, uh, so that's that's when I got in some trouble back then. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, after that is when I went and started working in startups. And at 19, I dropped out of college, uh, went to work for two of the former founders of MySpace at a startup. So uh, that was where I got a lot of my experience. Uh, we, uh, they, the guys had walked away, you know, the MySpace guys walked away with about $50 million when MySpace had got acquired. And then uh, they spent it in about three years. <laughs> And uh, we did not find an investor and the company failed. So oh. yeah, it was, uh, it, was, it was a good educational experience. I'll, let me put it that way. Um, you know, I got, to, I got to be involved in marketing. I got to be involved in development. I got to be in, involved in special projects. Uh, you know, I got to do some production work. Uh, so I got to kind of like jump around that startup and that was, you know, and then I, was getting paid to do this. I didn't go into, I have no student loans. I didn't, you know, I didn't uh, take, incur any debt like, you know, a lot of people. Uh, so I got to work under experienced entrepreneurs. Uh, so that really, that really kind of set the foundation for who I would later become and who I am now. Um, so, you know, eventually I went to work for Playboy, uh, did internet marketing and web development for them. Then I did, uh, and then I worked for a medical research company. I did lead generation and web development and internet marketing for them. Then I took those techniques and used them on myself. I realized like, so like I was working for all these companies, right? So, you know, I realized, oh, all this lead generation, all this marketing automation, all this stuff I was doing. And this was like back in, you know, 2010, 2011, before anybody even used the term marketing automation. You know, I was building and hacking these systems together on my own uh, using WordPress plugins and whatever. Um, and I realized, wait a second, why am I promoting other people? Um, like I could use all these tools that I've been using on all these other companies and I could promote myself and my own products. Uh, so that was kind of like the aha moment uh, that led to my startup because I was like, oh, I, you know, I should do this for me. Um, so I did and it worked. 
it worked too well. Um, so that led to CyberChimps, which was uh, the company that I bootstrapped to a million dollars in revenue and then eventually sold about five years later. And there it is. That's right. I was um, once in Trent, that apartment there that's showing on, on <laughs> the screen. Yeah. And I felt like uh, I was just sitting in a stereotype. And Trent had, <laughs> you know, he learned how to read on a Mac because it would, your dad was working in Silicon Valley and got yeah. paid with a Mac at one point. And yeah. then, um, <laughs> you know, he's sitting there in a really nice place in San Francisco and he's only 30 <laughs> years old. And we were 31. talking about, okay, 30 <laughs> ish. And, uh, and so, yeah, just kind of that, what you almost would read in a book of that culture in San Francisco, of being young, innovative, breaking rules and boundaries, and, you know, an asymmetric career that ends up being symmetrical by almost stereotype. Yeah. So, yeah, he's breaking into Steve Jobs' uh, events as a teen. With a <laughs> and you're just like, man, what am I reading a movie script? So, well, and then, really, of course, I met you just about, gosh, almost, what was that, nine, ten months ago now? Um, that's right, yeah. Yeah, and uh, why don't you tell us a little about your background and your adventure, because you chose a very different path than I did. Uh, I don't even have a high school degree. Like, I, <laughs> I just, I'm like, you know, I didn't even show up to high school. I dropped out of college. Like, I was just like, I just did not participate in the system, but uh, yeah, and it's two worlds colliding. I'm more of that. Yeah. I come from a very structured background. I'm on the East Coast. I grew up in Baltimore. Went to private school. Um, end up then joining the military, um, and became a cryptologic linguist. And um, I guess to give the two minute, uh, was a Spanish linguist at the National Security Agency uh, right before 9/11. I was working, you know, doing Spanish linguist stuff, 9-11 hits, and I had to, or got a task out on this detail to go inside the crash site and try to pull out certain documents, you know. So that was kind of like this, like, baptism of fire in this new security world that happened after 9-11. Uh, as a young man, I was then shipped off to the invasion of Iraq and, you know, finished my time out in the Marines after that deployment and started working at the Pentagon. And once in the Pentagon, it was, you know, another trip out to Iraq and three more trips out to Afghanistan. Um, my last tour in Afghanistan, I lived with a Navy SEAL platoon in an Afghan village for six months and did a lot of good writing uh, about kind of where governance and the people met and meet, you know, miss and match. And uh, that's what kind of got me you know, to kind of see the world through a different lens, you know, living among Afghan people and understanding that, you know, they were just kind of simple farmers. We were dealing with poor people and using tanks and, you know, airplanes to deal with farmers. And it was such this like incongruent <laughs> uh, a dynamic. So started a company, you know, got left the Pentagon and started a company that was going to try to help that friction zone where the people and governments come together and they're in conflict. And that led me and my uh, compatriots down to Columbia for the first year of our company to consult in that peace process. And then the Ebola uh, outbreak in West Africa happened when I was uh, down in Columbia. And through my old work connections, got kind of shifted over to respond to Ebola, where we started building clinics uh, in really remote areas of Liberia. And I tell you, with all the things I've been through in the Middle East, life got complicated when we hit African soil and more than a human host, Ebola needs chaos to survive. And so I, you know, we really cut our teeth in the toughest market in Africa. And after Ebola, we linked up with uncle Sam, gave us some money to build a uh, carbon negative power grid that takes five hours from a paved road in the middle of Liberia. So this is a power grid that runs off like coconut husks in agricultural waste mm -hmm. and produces electricity in a spot that, you know, it's 2017 and they've never had electricity there. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, we kind of felt comfortably like, hey, this was tough, you know. We had to put electricity there using a different method and, you know, going through these really difficult conditions. We saw, we were witness to two witch trials 
during this uh, <laughs> during this time. Uh, my partner, he was there at one of these witch trials, and they were explaining to him what's happening. And at the end of it, the guy that explained him the whole thing goes, hey, do you want to be Facebook friends? <laughs> and he's just like, wow, this is like kind of like right there, the, the absolute frontier. And yes, everybody's still on Facebook. <laughs> Even though they're having witch trials. Yeah, witch trials, cannibalism. There was an uptick in... Uh, and sacrificial killings of young girls because of the election year. You know, wow. so a lot of kind of witchcraft or, or what they call black magic in that part of Africa that uh, still practice that thing. So th these are the, the challenges we had, not to mention, you know, yeah. it's the third or fourth most corrupt country on the planet. And, uh, you know, it just kind of was a crazy knife fight. So I, I came back after two years in Liberia, came back to the United States and was looking for kind of different answers and technologies to solve the problems of development and building stability in West Africa. Mm -hmm. And that's where I came across Trent, one of the first people I came across in, in San Francisco. And when I was telling him we were taking waste and turning it into trash, he calls me up later and he goes, man, I've been thinking about what you do. And there's these new things called ICOs where you can build economies around your industry and you're in a pretty interesting industry. And that's where my mind started going, whoa, and started reading about the blockchain and cryptocurrencies and how this kind of would, would uh, um, affect me and what I was trying to do. And Trent and I then got together, wrote out a white paper and created a cryptocurrency that uh, is based on the conversion of renewable energy sources into electricity. So in that pursuit, we... Uh, <laughs> we decided to come up with this podcast to kind of announce to the world what our intention was and to document it yeah. and to be, you know, it kind of fits that principle of transparency. You know, we have an agenda to, you know, reverse climate change and podcasting is a low cost, high impact activity that we can do to pursue that goal. So we felt like as, as if we've taken on this charge of climate change and creating economic models, that help incentivize human behavior to be more uh, aligned with the finding balance in our environment, then as responsible stewards, we should start this podcast to start documenting our journey and calling out other problem solvers to join us. And this is a great kind of um, incident or bank, uh, beacon for that. Absolutely. I mean, ultimately the way I see it is, you know, as we started going through our own ICO process and, you know, figuring out all these ins and outs, it was like, wait a second, like, we've got we've to figure out how do we reach out to developers? How do we reach out to, you know, other people that we want to get involved with, with this project? And also just network with others that other projects and other people that we find interesting. And that's been the most fascinating thing in all of this is we've been meeting some amazing people. Like, we went into this thing having no idea what was going to happen next. And the next thing you know, we're like getting meetings with UN dignitaries. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's just been this crazy experience. And then, you know, we change our LinkedIn and, you know, all of a sudden five people a day are like wanting to be our friends. And like, we're like, whoa, 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 like what's going on here? So then we realized like we could actually, you know, start bringing people on the show, start talking about ICOs, start talking about crypto, start talking about blockchain talk about what's happening with this crazy cryptocurrency space uh, and just kind of have a conversation with people, you know, talk about all the different technologies, all the different intentions and business ideas and different opportunities that are about to present themselves to the world. Uh, Cause we're on, you know, we're on the verge of a, a new internet, like revolution, evolution, whatever this is, you know, I hate to coin another like internet 3.0 term or whatever. I guess I just did, but uh, <laughs> you know, we're, we're coming into something in 2018 here. Uh, this is a, you know, there's, there's something happening with the blockchain. There's something happening with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Uh, this is, you know, this is a global movement that's taking place right now. And, you know, ultimately crypto disrupted, I think is kind of our opportunity to kind of capture some of that and present it to the world. Uh, because, you know, we've had an, uh, we're in a unique position of understanding these technologies coming from, you know, these, you know, kind of interesting, very different backgrounds. Uh, you know, I'm in San Francisco, you're in Washington, DC. 
uh, we're coming at it from very different angles, but at the same time, you know, we're kind of bridging those two worlds together and then also kind of being able to communicate with other people and see what they're working on around the world. Um, so. And you bring up a really good point that it is that broad spectrum where I think a lot of the, the blockchain and crypto discussions happen for and about Silicon Valley, uh, New York, London, you know, these, these financial uh, worlds and realms. And I have to sit back and when I deal with that uh, imposter syndrome, <laughs> I sit there and go, no, not everybody left the Pentagon and went into the trenches of the bowl <laughs> yeah. and started building uh, electric grids. So my, my perspective is unique and does have kind of valor, you know, valor and, and uh, I have a place in the converse, in this conversation. And that's why, you know, I Trent turned me on to a publication on medium called hacker noon. And I've been able to start documenting there the ideas of what cryptocurrency and the blockchain are going to mean for the most vulnerable humans on the planet. You know, we're talking about, you know, having global consensus and zero trust working environments. Well, that means that to get justice in a lot of ways, you have to have money, you have to have resources and African women don't have those. <laughs> so if we can create, you know, these uh, computer aided working environments that are, that are fair in design, well, that only serves to help most these types of people like African women. But African women aren't represented in Silicon Valley. Not Nor, and, and one of the things I hope to expose is like one of the feedbacks we get from, you know, a lot of our encounters is, hey, uh, nobody cares about Africa to come down to it. Change your pitch. <laughs> You're just like, I know nobody cares. That's why it's that way. So uh, we, uh, we hope to be that kind of spearhead that shows that there, there is more to the planet than you know sometimes what we see and this technology can impact uh you know all of humanity and what does that really mean and to exp explore and examine that and, and ultimately what you just hit on is you know governance uh you know governance is going to be a really important factor in being able to move forward globally as a society um you know is having transparency and having systems in place where there is transparency. Like, for example, why can't we read our politicians' emails? Why not? Like, why can't you have transparency into the political system and understand who's dealing, who's making what deals and why, and you know, what lobbyists are involved in what? Those yeah, kind of things. The government is so calls. quick. Yeah. I, I like what the government is quick to adapt technologies and face it at the people. Mm -hmm. And what the blockchain represents is kind of like, uh, you know, putting that trans transparency gun to themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I hope that, you know, the future, all governments do worry about having all of their communications uh, captured on a ledger. And as the people, we should write, we should, <laughs> we say, no, 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 mass email deletes is not transparency. It's the opposite of transparency. You know, we want our government to act like somebody's going to read their work afterward and at some point well in ledger systems as a whole could also be used for voting uh you know we've got a major issue with voting both in the united states but also globally getting people to actually participate and vote is an issue here in the united states and then making sure that vote actually counts <laughs> that's a whole other set of challenges uh and you know ultimately blockchain technology could potentially solve that so you know, there's, there's a lot of different things that you can do with the blockchain above and beyond cryptocurrency and above and beyond, you know, what Bitcoin is today. Bitcoin, Ethereum, some of these existing, you know, cryptocurrencies and what we're seeing right now, this is just 1.0, maybe. This is like alpha, like we're not even to the beta phase yet. Um, these are proof of concepts. So now that we've proven that these concepts work and you know, have a, you know, a sustainable model for being able to move these kind of systems forward. Now we get to go to the fun part where, you know, over the next one to three to five years, uh, you know, we get to go build a whole new system of decentralized applications in different use cases. So that is ultimately, I mean, you could build everything from, you know, alternative to Twitter to Facebook uh, you could build a whole new way of communicating via email messaging. Uh, 
Um, you know, there's a wide variety of different things that you're going to be able to build and decentralize so that there is no company behind it. So the only thing that's behind the technology is actual human beings using that technology because that technology has a value. So instead of, you know, instead of these systems that we have today that are valued by the dollar, that are valued by the stock market, that are valued by advertising and, you know, all these semi-corrupt systems. Um, oh, let's face it, they're pretty corrupt. <laughs> you know, uh, these corrupt systems, we have the chance to go build systems that are incorruptible by nature, that by design are trust, you know, are trustless, um, that, you know, don't allow you to cheat or harm or do anything that isn't transparent to the rest of the people involved in the organization um, or the system that you're participating in. So by design, we can create systems that are not optimized for money, not optimized for control, but actually optimized for people and actually achieving things of value for humanity rather than achieving something that's just going to make someone else richer. Yeah, and that's one of those things where it's, it's hard for people to kind of wrap their heads around. A characteristic of this new economy that the blockchain allows or provides is that it's going to reward cooperation over competition. And so it's so difficult to contemplate kind of a, a bettering of your life and your position without a negative to the person next to you. Yeah. And, and, and that, that, that dynamic in our heads is there. It's like, how do I get more than everybody else? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I struggle with it too. I'm not sitting here on an ivory tower. Like <laughs> when I look at business models now and I know this technology is there, like there's certain times where things are so decentralized where it's just like, well, I guess we're just going to have to kind of go down this road and then be all, when we all benefit from it, that's how we all kind of rise with it. This so. is definitely uncharted territory. And that's ultimately, I think that's what this podcast is about is how do we, you know, how do we bring some light to what's happening? Um, because, you know, all of this is so new. There are no best practices. There is no model that works. Um, you know, there, this is literally creating a new economies, creating new currencies, uh, creating new systems of governance. Uh, you know, these are, these are obtuse ideas. I mean, and, and you have to almost take a step back from what you know of reality because, you know, everybody thinks money is real. Well, hate to break it to you, it's not. It's a number on a computer screen and it has been since the 70s. Mm -hmm. So there's no gold, there's no vault, uh, there's no, you know, giant warehouse with, you know, printed dollars. There's, there's nothing. It's literally just numbers on a screen. So you know, the US dollar as we know of it today really doesn't exist other than in our minds. And it's a belief system. It, it's a belief system just as much as a religious belief system. Um, so there's no actual, there's nothing that actually says that, you know, the US dollar is worth this. Um, you know, the systems we've created around it say, yeah, this company is worth X amount of dollars. And, you know, that computer is sold for this amount. And, you know, we've created all these systems around this belief system of what the U.S. dollar is, but the U.S. dollar itself is still a belief system. So what happens when people change their beliefs and realize that, wait, I can now value this banana coin for representing bananas, and I no longer have to measure bananas in U.S. dollars? What happens then? I don't know. I can't tell and you. <laughs> Extend that out to, uh, you know, what we're trying to do with the, uh, the use of blockchain and how it impacts the environment. And to say that with the environment, if the blockchain can create cryptocurrencies, which, you know, smart contracts say XYZ happens, boom, coin is distributed. Well, we can now reward any behavior, which means you can reward cleaning, you know, disposing of trash. Uh, not cutting a tree down or, you know, kind of, <laughs> these are now huge, you know, economic models now exist that we can start, you know, helping syncopate what's best for the human beings and the environment and the economy of the, of all of them. And that syncopation is another mind boggling thing that I would say like, you know, novels in the seventies about utopias, 
<laughs> may have kind of said, hey, something's going to have to change. Something about human nature, obviously, you know, that was usually the requirement, like human nature yeah. at some point would change. But now, you know, nobody could calculate that, that computer programming could help us create working environments where the trust is not, you know, there or we can put value to a clean earth. I had a, uh, a, a potential investor into the coin, read our white paper, and he's like, he said, it brought me to tears. I've been an environmentalist and try to live a clean, balanced life since the 70s. And this message, I, I don't even have the hope that, hey, change your human behavior on a mass scale or else mm -hmm. the planet's going to die is not, has failed. That message has failed. He goes, but now there's a technology now. And he goes, I feel like there's actually hope. And of course, he, he was like, it's so simple, it's, it's, it's logical that it had to have been an economic system that changes yes. the way the environment is going. That like How humans interact with the environment has to be an economic system. Duh. <laughs> not an NGO. It's not a government. It's not a celebrity. Yeah. You know, it's an economic system that says plastic being processed properly is money because it's valued to humanity. And then, boom, every you know, everybody's worried about picking up plastic and disposing it properly because they need money. They need value. <laughs> they want to well, eat. They want to change it for other things. And there's a, like, so there's a fallacy that people believe that economics is a science. And it's not a science. It's a man-made system. So it's literally, again, it's a belief system. So when you have these different economic models, you know, we've, as a society, we've been prevented from being able to create new economic models because we've been attached to this one specific currency, especially in the United States. And in other countries, they're attached to their currencies as well. So whoever controls that currency controls the economic models. So they then control the incentives for why and how people participate in their environment, which unfortunately has been driven towards profits rather than doing the right thing for the planet. So that's one of the things we were exploring with RenewCoin was, you know, how can we create an, an incentive model to get people to go to the bathroom, not in the street, but, you know, in a bathroom that's actually going to potentially produce renewable energy? How do we get them to pick up their trash and actually get rewarded and paid for not littering? So, you know, now you can apply economic incentives because you're giving them a digital cryptocurrency instead of, you know, a, a belief system that has been predefined, you know, before you and I were even born. The U.S. dollar is older than we are. So we, know, we didn't get any input on, you know, what kind of economic system we wanted to be involved in in our lives and that we wanted to grow up in. We got zero input. So cryptocurrency and the blockchain enables us now to go, hey, we're going to create our own economic systems and we're going to incentivize our own systems with the things we actually value, which again, can be pretty much anything. Uh, I mean, you could build a cryptocurrency for anime. If you like anime, uh, you could build a cryptocurrency for pretty much anything that, you know, any large group of people associates value with associate some kind of value based service around that. And then, create that currency as a function or a metric of trade and start trading and doing commerce in that currency. Uh, you know, that is a, that is a revolutionary concept. Uh, no previous generation has had the access to the tools to be able to say, you know what, I don't like your economy. I'm going to go build my own. And that's where we're at right now. So yeah, and one of, the, <laughs> one of the punches the blockchain takes is, oh, there's going to be thousands of cryptocurrencies. Yeah. And I say, yes, that's amazing. <laughs> because, you know, there's going to become a time, you know, that you're not going to, well, probably me, I'm a little bit older. So I don't think my granddaughter will ever date anybody who carries cash. Because you're oh, going to have fuel credit or fuel coins. You're going to have pizza coins. You're going to have babysitting coins. <laughs> There'll be these so many economies and your wallet will, will have value dedicated for whatever you need. Yep. And, you know, the people that have the anonymous, there will obviously be anonymity coins and, you know, mm -hmm. cash or Krugerrand still, you know, kind of like <laughs> just gold. Those things will still exist, but they'll have that stigma of, what are you dealing people you know what are you hiding why, <laughs> yeah. why are your finances like so private and not to say that you have everybody dipping into what you're doing but yeah if you're trading i don't know childcare, 
in a childcare currency, it's just kind of a way, you know, you know, babysitters are making more money because a bank's not involved in their, <laughs> their little commerce uh, or the local pizza place has its own, you know, currency and you create value in their system and then trade it for their product. You know, that just kind of happens without a centralized authority. Yeah. Well, and and, this sounds complicated, but it's not because it's really just bartering. So this is the, this is how trade always was. So that's a thing that people need to understand is like previous to the industrial revolution, that was trade. So that's how trade worked is, you know, you would trade one thing for another thing and you would have to figure out, you know, how many of these things are worth how many of those things. And that was, that's how things got done. So it wasn't until the industrial revolution, it wasn't until the invention of these, you know, mass currencies that we actually then got put into an artificial system that no longer reflected the value of actual things. So, you know, as complicated as it might sound as every, you know, different market having its own currency, it's actually not because this is how things were before there was any of these things. And now we're going back to a more natural system of decentralization. So ultimately that in and of itself is going to enable a different form of trade where now you're actually valuing the items that you're trading and it doesn't just come a, become a commodity. So now there's, there's going to be measurable metrics based off the value of these different currencies. And then computers are also going to help us with the actual trading. So it's not like, you know, you're going to go to the pizza store and like have to whip out your cell phone and do a, you know, 30 minute calculation on how I'm going to buy my pizza. You know, your phone's going to have some machine learning. These, these exchanges are going to become more advanced and it's just going to be an instant transaction. You're not going to think about it. Um, so it's not going to be confusing. You know, you're going to trade something of value to that, you know, that business and they're going to get some kind of currency in exchange for their currency or vice versa or whatever. So depending upon the situation, you know, the, the, the actual technology, the blockchain itself, as well as machine learning and some of these other technologies are going to step in and make this process really easy. It's going to take a while to get there, but that's what we're looking at. Yeah. And uh, I was going to say a good example of that is in, going on in Kenya right now is uh, a lot of people are just trading cell phone minutes. Yeah. Cell phone minutes are, are valuable. Everybody on this planet has some kind of device. Yep. <laughs> I've been in the deepest, darkest places that have no electricity. They use <laughs> motorcycle batteries. I was like, why are people using cell phones here? There's no electricity. They use <laughs> motorcycle batteries to charge their phones. And uh, so it's so important that they said, you know what? The value is in these minutes. Mm -hmm. And they start trading minutes instead of like currencies or other types of currencies. Because I guess it does turn into a currency at that point. Or I guess like cigarettes in jail. That's another good example. Papa <laughs> yeah. ramen I hear is real popular in jails. So I've oh. never been, but uh, <laughs> know a few people. <laughs> well, um, so yeah, so that's kind of where we're going with, with, with the podcast is we're trying to lay out our ideas. We do have an agenda. Um, we do want other problem solvers to come out of the woodwork and help us where we have unique and good perspectives and access and position, but there's other people out there. This is uh, a lot of, like I said, we honestly believe this next economy will be based on cooperation. So uh, we're looking for all partners possible. So yeah. Come join us, come be on the show, come take a look at some of the stuff we're working on, get involved. Um, you know, this is uh, ultimately, you know, we're, we're doing this, both for ourselves as a learning experience, but also uh, to help, you know, further this movement to get more like minds to be able to be exposed to these ideas and realize that, uh, you know, we're, we're on the forefront of something right now that's changing the world already. Uh, you know, what Bitcoin's already accomplished, what Ethereum's already accomplished, uh, you know, these, these new systems that we can build, uh, they're going, they're already changing the world. They're going to continue to change the world. And we have an opportunity right now, all of us, to get involved and make better systems. Yeah, that syncopate people, planet, profit. That's, yeah. the, that's one of my <laughs> biggest is like, oh, you know, it used to be that triple bottom line is, you know, well, if you're worried about the environment, that comes at a profit uh, negative. 
you know, we have to dispose of our waste properly, that's an extra cost. But the blockchain allows us to syncopate those and that is one of the biggest innovations of human organization. And so, yeah, come join uh, the movement. We appreciate your attention and uh, we hope to hear from you.